also worthy of note is that MLK Day is the only federal holiday designated as a national day of service to encourage all Americans to volunteer to improve their communities. And on that, we'll watch a, a, a film, a short film, about 23 minutes, which is a compilation of um, speeches by Dr. King. And then uh, speaker Maya Parker will share insights and then we'll take questions from you. So please stand by as we watch the video. Hello. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later. <laughs> the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men Yes, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. <laughs> but we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time 
to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. Negro is granted his citizenship right. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. <laughs> they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the city. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. <laughs> we cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. <laughs> Satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We 
to hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal.
concrete is the conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old as I happen to be, and some great truth stands before the door of his life, some great opportunity to stand up for that which is right. He's afraid his home will get bombed. Or he's afraid that he will lose his job. Or he's afraid that he will get shot or beat down by state troopers. He may go on and live until he's 80. Yeah. But he's just as dead as 36 as he would be at 80. And the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died. when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. Yes. So we're going to stand up right here amid horses. Yes. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid the billy clubs. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid police dogs if they have them. We're going to stand up amid tear gas. Yes. We're going to stand up amid anything that they can muster up, yes. letting the world know yes. that we are determined to be free. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Yeah. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization. Black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. 
for those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling I had a member of my family killed but he was killed by a white man but we have to make an effort in the United States we have to make an effort to understand to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times a favorite poem I my favorite poet was Aeschylus and he once wrote even in our sleep pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God what we need in the United States is not division what we need in the United States is not hatred what we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country whether they be white or whether they be black we can do well in this country we will have difficult times we've had difficult times in the past but we will and we will have difficult times in the future it is not the end of violence it is not the end of lawlessness and it's not the end of disorder but the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together want to improve the quality of our life and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land with and what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people thank you very much Okay, thank you. Thank you for staying with us. I hope you found that very insightful. Um, quick one before I hand over to our, our, our presenter or our lead facilitator, Ms. Maya Parker, I'll ask that if you are not speaking, kindly put your microphones off. And if you have any questions to ask during the course of a submission, you kindly raise your hand and then we would, would invite you to make them um, ask your questions. And in view of that, I'll quickly hand over the event to Ms. Maya Parker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you all for joining us today um, to celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, to remember his legacy and all that he contributed toward um, justice for all Americans. Um, so we've seen so far um, two speeches by Dr. King and a speech by President John F. Kennedy. Um, I'd like to give just a little bit of background about Dr. Martin Luther King, just to um, provide a bit of context. Um, his name is quite familiar. His speeches may be very familiar to a lot of us, um, but I'd like to share a little bit about his life and then we'll quickly open the conversation up for discussion and I'll encourage everybody to participate. All right, so let's, let's delve in and just learn a little bit about Dr. Martin Luther King. So Dr. King was a Baptist minister. Um, he was an activist. He was born in 1929 
and he died in 1968. Um, the civil rights movement that he was really the major spokesperson of, definitely not the only spokesperson, but a major spokesperson, that civil rights movement had a long span, but the period in which he was involved mainly was from 1955 to 1968. And, you know, we ask ourselves, why the civil rights movement? What was significant about it? What were those who were involved really pushing for? Um, so at the time, in the, in the 50s and 60s in the United States, um, there was legal segregation. So it was by law, um, people of African descent, Black people, African Americans, they were not legally permitted to utilize the same public facilities as whites. So for example, if there is a public washroom, a public urinal, you would have whites only in one section and blacks only in another section. And if a person who was black went to the white only section, they could be arrested, okay? So, um, and there were other things that people were not uh, permitted to do such as um, they didn't have, so blacks didn't have equal access to employment, like jobs. Um, education was also segregated, so they had separate schools. So you had whites only could attend certain schools and blacks only could attend certain schools. So there was no mixing. So if you think of the context of Ghana, how, how interesting and maybe strange it might be to have an entire nation together, but one ethnic group can only you go to a particular school and another ethnic group can only go to a particular school. Um, so that was by law in the United States. Um, they couldn't ride the same, They although they rode on the same buses, um, whites had the, the front of the bus that was available to them and blacks had to sit at the back of the bus. So if a black person sat at the front of the bus, they could be arrested. So all these things were part of the laws in the United States. And um, when we look at Dr. Martin Luther King, we often, some may think, oh, he, he is the one who kind of championed the civil rights movement. But there were lots of organizations that, had, um, that were organizing in the communities. So you had the NAACP, you had, um, there's a, a organization called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was the president of. You had another, um, a number of youth organizations, like students who were mobilizing, people in communities who were mobilizing. So you had all these different organizations involved and if you, if you um, recall Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, I mean, if you see the thousands and thousands of people who were, who were there at Lincoln Memorial, um, they actually had coordinated, you had um, different organizations that had coordinated to bus in the participants. So people rode buses from different states all across America to attend that, that, um, that pivotal, uh, uh, forum, if you will. So, so um, the other thing that's important to know is that um, Dr. King, in as much as he was a, a, a leader and a strong spokesperson, um, people within and organizers within the civil rights movement actually selected him. Like they, they recognized that they needed a spokesperson. They needed somebody to be on the front line to be able to speak out. Um, not only to the broader black community, the broader American community, which included blacks, whites, Asians, Latinos, Native Americans, so many different people, but also um, he was central in liaising with government. So the civil rights movement had this two pronged approach. Um, one was what we call civil, diso civil disobedience which was like um, nonviolent protests. So no matter what would happen, if you had, you know, police coming to beat the protesters, 
they were trained. They were actually trained, and some people actually went to a school to learn how to practice and, and be successful in civil disobedience, not to retaliate physically. And that was also important because a lot of times these um, uh, incidences were televised. So if you can imagine, it's on television that maybe some people are protesting and they're getting beaten and the people are not fighting back. Any viewer could say, wait a minute, but they're not, they're not retaliating. So why, why are they being beaten, right? So, so these are some of the things. So the civil disobedience um, was one part, nonviolent protest. And then the other part was Dr. King and so many key civil rights leaders working with the government. So meeting with the president um, of the United States at that time meeting with legislators, leading, uh, meeting with, with um, local mayors and, and people who had, had the power and really authority um, to change the laws that kept um, uh, Blacks from having the same equal access as whites. So I just wanted to provide that bit of background and also to let, to let everyone know, Dr. King was very young um, in this effort. So um, during the Montgomery bus co boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, um, I believe that was 1955, he was only 26 years old when he was chosen as the spokesperson. So I think that's very significant because if we think of like the definition of a young person, he was in essence a young person. And unfortunately he passed away in his thirties. So still one would say still yet very young um, but lived an amazing, amazing legacy. So that's a little bit of background on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am very curious to hear um, from you all who are participating with us today. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do something. We're gonna have a discussion. We'll look at two areas. One is civic engagement. Um, some people call you have civic. So you have civic engagement, which you know. In their time, it was it was viewed as maybe activism, but we have civic engagement. What that looks like. So I have some questions for us to kind of turn around on that, and then also about volunteerism, people's perspectives, your views on volunteerism, and just to hear a little bit from you. Um, but first, I want us to delve into a little bit of a poll. So um, I'll I'll let my colleague uh, get ready for that. So we have three questions that we came up with, and we'd like you to use your computer on Zoom to tick your response. So we're just gonna give a few, a few seconds for that poll to come up, and that'll kick us off into our question and answer. Awesome. So first question. So you'll take the one that you think is correct. Whose teachings inspired Dr. King to engage in peaceful protests? Whose teachings? Was it Abraham Lincoln? Was it George Washington or Mahatma Gandhi? So I think you can just go ahead and tick the response. I won't tick mine because I don't wanna to, to bias the, <laughs> the responses. Okay, so we're gonna head over to question number two. What organization did Dr. King help establish? And he was also the president of that organization. Was it SNCC, which is S-S-N-C? Was it S-C-L-C? Or was it MBA? Which one do you think? Very good. And then we're gonna go to the last question. What historically black college did Dr. King attend? I didn't include that in the bio. I'm just curious to know who knows or who could guess correctly. Was it Morehouse College? Was it Tuskegee University? Or was it Fisk University? Which historically black college did Dr. King attend? Awesome. So 
what we'll do now is we'll delve into a bit of the Q&A and then we'll come back to see how well we did with the poll. Okay, so um, before we delve in, I'm going to uh, pop over back to Andrew. Andrew, can you give us a little bit of guidance on how, like the best way we can go about the Q&A? I can ask a question and then people can unmute and respond or they could type in the chat box. What's your thought? Um, thank you, Maya. Um, I think for, as you rightly said, people, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question. You can also raise your hand and then we'll let, uh, we'll, we'll ask you to ask your question. Or you can also equally type in the chat box and we'll, we'll read them out to Maya to address them. So whichever you are comfortable with, you, you can adapt any of them. But just a reminder, if you are not speaking, kindly put your microphones on mute and then you turn your videos off after all so we can we can know who, who is active and who is not. Thank you. Perfect. Very good. So I'm just going to give it like 15 seconds. Does anyone have a question? Based on what we saw, we, we, we viewed and listened to two of Dr. King's speeches and also we heard from President John F. Kennedy, does anyone have a question before we delve into the questions that I have for the group? So I'm not actually counting the 15 seconds, but I'll say I'll feel the 15 seconds. <laughs> so that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and delve in. And I'm going to ask, um, ask us a few questions for us to kind of think about. I want to start with civic engagement. Um, you know, if you read up on Dr. King, he's often described as a Baptist minister and an activist, right? Um, but ultimately, we have, we have the whole topic of civic engagement, getting involved. We saw all those people at, um, at the Lincoln Memorial during Dr. King's speech, right? So a lot of them were part of local organizations. A lot of them were involved locally. So my question for the group is, um, what are forms of civic engagement? When you think of civic engagement, what are forms of civic engagement? What comes to mind? What are forms of civic engagement? So let me give you an example. Um, um, you can raise your hand if you have an answer to this. So were any of you ever involved in like um, a SRC at your school? Or whether it was um, SHS or if, if you went to uni or in uni, involved in any SRC or any club? And if so, just, just, just kind of chime in and let me know anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a civic engagement thing, but if it was like, um, I don't know, if there was like a gospel club or some other type of club, if, were you involved in, in any type of um, organization? Don't make me call on somebody. I will do it. <laughs> And sorry in advance if I don't if I don't pronounce your name well. Okay, I want to ask Penny Isaac only because I see this big big smile on your face. <laughs> so can you please unmute and share with us? Have were you ever involved in like an SRC or any type of club at at a school or a church or mosque or anything like that? Hey, thank you very much, Maya. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, you can nod your head if you can hear. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I fully really enjoyed myself. Um, I remember way back on campus, I was part of this uh, Christian organization. Um, it was a Bible study club, and uh, I happened to be the organizer. Mm -hmm. It was quite a wonderful experience. You contributing your quota to um, make everything successful. It was pretty much a wonderful experience. And I remember there were times where things were very difficult. Things didn't really go the way we wanted as a team or as a group, but we needed to uh, settle um, 
down and make sure everything was on point um, just to make everything happen. Awesome. That's excellent. That is excellent. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you. You can put your, you can put your, um, uh, you can mute. Thank you. You knew where, you knew where I was going. <laughs> um, no, that's really, that's really helpful. And I think you bring up a great point because oftentimes when, when we think about like some type of um, group or club or civic engagement, not everyone will see eye to eye. In fact, a person can be from the same household and have different opinions, right? So just imagine people coming together from different perspectives, different homes, different um, contexts into one organization, and now you're working toward a joint goal. There could be some disagreements, right? You can just nod your head if you agree or shake your head no if you disagree, right? There could be, there could be um, some, some disagreements or difficulty that you have to work through. The key is always, I think, keeping your eye on the prize, keeping your eye on the fact that we're all here for a joint reason. Um, I know in the beginning of this uh, Zoom that Andrew laid out some ground rules, right? And I think oftentimes for organizations, um, it's helpful to have ground rules. For example, if you have a group that's together and everyone is speaking, like everyone wants to ch chip in, one of the ground rules may be, okay, whoever's speaking, let the person finish their points before you come in, right? And make your point. And everybody agrees, okay, these are the ground rules. So I think sometimes these are the types of things that help organizations, clubs, and so forth be successful in their endeavors. Great, so thank you again, Isaac, for that. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, Andrew, I think we have a few questions that have come in on the chat. Could you select one that we can um, address? And um, I think um, it was basically um, answers to what you asked what civic engagement was. Okay. Um, I think Osman Ibrahim says civic engagement means championing a cause for public good. Hmm. And Bernice Dobie says, voting is an example of civic engagement. Patricia Amabunsu says, public advocacy is a form of civic engagement. And Nadia Gabriel Michel says, civic engagement means participation in issues concerning the public. And um, I think the last one is from Mr. Michael Asari, who says, yeah. So inclusive participation in public issues from community engagement, volunteering, advocacy, and maybe revolution. Hmm. That, <laughs> That's the hardcore <laughs> one, right? That, 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 <laughs> that is a bit questionable, but those are some of the comments that have come so far. Wow, thank you all. Thank you for your, your submissions. This is great. Um, yes, so we, I agree with what a lot of people um, mentioned about civic engagement. And, um, you know, one thing that, that strikes me so much with um, Dr. King's messaging throughout, um, I don't know if, if you all are aware, but um, during, during his time, there were kind of like two schools of thought, okay? You had one where it was kind of like, um, the use of civil disobedience. That was what Dr. King was promoting and nonviolence. And then you had another school of thought, which was like, Chale, no, if we want it, we have to take it. And so, um, and both, both, both were implemented, but in essence, and, and I'm sure this could lead to a um, interesting dialogue and maybe even a debate one day, maybe we have a debate uh, session on it in the future. I don't know, but one one interesting thing is um, when you think of the results of both, um, Dr. King and and those who promoted um, nonviolence and civil disobedience. I personally think they were able to make um, kind of like many more strides in a short period of time in terms of breaking down the legal barriers when it came to um, um, uh, segregation 
Um, and when you think about, and, and we did, there was another school of thought, just like bear arms in, in public and, you know, we have to like, whatever, like use violence if we need to. And unfortunately, so many lives were lost during that time. And so many people were jailed at that time. So when you think about kind of like um, both schools of thought, you know, they both have their implications. And it's something to, to definitely always think about, like, okay, looking forward, what, what, how can we make, what is our ultimate goal, right? And how can we achieve that goal effectively? And also, you know, how do we not, how do we preserve, um, as Dr. King um, said in many of his speeches, protect the lives of people and also to protect property? Because you don't want, like, you look out and now, you know, the community is all torn to pieces. No, you still have to live in that community tomorrow. So it's very, very interesting. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shift a little bit because I want us to um, uh, touch on volunteerism. But before we do that, I don't know Archibald if we have our poll results from those three questions. Interesting, interesting. Okay, whose teachings inspired Dr. King to engage in peaceful protests? Interestingly, I had a feeling some people would have thought it was Abraham Lincoln, but actually it was Mahatma Gandhi. And I was, it's almost split. You see, we almost have like half and half, but Mahatma Gandhi, that, that was the correct answer on that one. And then um, what organization did Dr. King help establish? And the SCLC is correct. The Southern Christian Leadership Council, no, Congress. Oh gosh, that last word, conference, sorry. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, that's correct. And then what historically black college did King attend? And yes, Morehouse College, 68%. So well done to you all, kudos to you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna delve a little bit into um, uh, the topic of volunteerism. And Andrew, um, definitely keep tracking the chat questions that come in or comments, because I do want to make sure people get a chance to, um, for us to hear their comments. Um, uh, well, Maya, just a quick one. Okay. Um, Masa Adam also made a, an observation. I said during the documentary the film, he saw white people were at some of Martin Luther King's rally, probably mm -hmm. wondering why there were white people there and all that, too, if you can speak to that. Oh. Excellent. So um, this, I think that's a that's a that's an excellent question, um, and and it's it helps to um, touch on an important misconception about the civil rights movement and the civil rights period. One would think, oh, the civil rights movement was only black people, but that's not true. There were so many white people and so many people of different ethnicities that wanted to see equality for all Americans. So they were friends, they were allies, the, the, the um, white people who attended. You know, the forum wasn't a, a black only forum, right? It was for all people who wanted to see equal justice in America, and which was so many people. And um, I mentioned um, SNCC, which is one a, a youth organization largely um, comprised of students. And many, many, many of those students were Caucasian students. So there were friends, there were allies. Um, the civil rights movement, you had so many people that, that, um, that were in support of civil rights and maybe didn't even know, well, what can I do as a citizen? Like, I agree with Dr. King. I agree with the civil rights um, movement. What can I do as a citizen? So I'll give you one example. Um, during the bus boycott of 1955, Montgomery, Alabama, um, so there was, a, there was a boycott of the buses because the buses were segregated, okay? And blacks could only sit at the back and whites in the front. There were several people, mostly women, um, African-American women who 
sat at the front of the bus, you may have heard of uh, Rosa Parks, who um, sat at the front of the bus and was arrested. So um, many of these women were also part of the NAACP or other organizations that were promoting um, civil rights and and equal equal um, equality and justice. And so them sitting at the front of the bus and getting arrested was um, also very symbolic to kick off a huge bus boycott. So they boycotted the buses. So you had so many African Americans boycotting the buses. But and so what they ended up doing was they had people using their private cars to drive one another to work, right? So it's not that they were all walking now that they couldn't take the bus. It's like almost as if there was a massive protest on Chocho's where everyone walked. No, you had people who had their private cars um, and some even bought cars so that they could ride. And there was one gentleman who was a Caucasian male, white male, and he was the, the driver of one of those cars that would do the routes to pick people up. So you had so many supporters, you know, that's important to um, know that. Sorry, I kind of belabored that point a little bit, but I think it was a great, great question, great point. Um, okay, yeah, and before you go on, I think um, Kizito Kuju had his hand up. I don't know if he, he can ask his question now. Kizito. Sure. I, I, I didn't know if you were speaking. I was just trying to put a point across and I mistakenly um, oh. raised my hand. But my, my point is there that, I mean, during the videos that played out, um, one of the things that kept, you know, um, uh, popping up in almost Dr. all Dr. King's uh, public speeches was the use of nonviolent um, protest. And I, I was just trying to re-echo the point that this is something that the caring generation must learn to to abide by. I mean, yes, we can do advocacy in, in several forms and we should as well as always try as much as possible to make it nonviolent. Violence doesn't really get us the, the response that we need because it causes a lot of public distraction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent point. Thank you. Perfect. No, I, I, I totally agree. And it's, it, it's definitely a point that Dr. King, I mean, we, we had the opportunity to see excerpts, I think of three of his speeches, but he, he, he delivered so many speeches all across America. And his message was always consistent about the importance of nonviolence and just encouraging. And, and, and at that time, sometimes he would also speak with the youth of that day, right? Um, of encouraging them to um, exercise civil disobedience. I mean, look, look where we are now. We're in 2021 and we're still talking about Dr. King. We're still talking about his legacy and the impact that he made and the impact of the civil rights era, you know? So that says a lot. I think it says a whole lot. Any other question that we have? Um. Betty Bando has made an interesting uh, comment. It said, years ago, in many parts of the country, people volunteered to build schools, toilet facilities, and generally help to improve the social amenities in their communities. This is not so common in recent times, unfortunately. Uh, any idea why uh, our zeal for volunteerism has gone down in recent times, Maya? That's interesting. I actually would like to turn that back to our audience to find out um, whether they agree. Number one, do you think the zeal for volunteerism has gone down? And if so, why do you think that might be? Well, um, there's, there's, there, there's an interesting one from um, Nadia. She says, um, unfortunately, nowadays people want to be paid for such kind things rather than doing it voluntarily. Mm -hmm. I think the, the quest for money and the zeal to be paid for every little thing we do. I I see Isaac and Kingsford have their hands up. So we'll take the first one from Kingsford and then Isaac can follow up with his question as well. So Kingsford, over to you. Okay. Um, hello. Hope everybody can hear me now. Yes. 
Well, um, one reason why I think the zeal for volunteerism has um, actually go down in terms of building of schools in order to help the social standard of life is um, kind of related to the government. Because uh, I think excessive bureaucracy in our system puts people off. Because if I'm in the capacity, I have the capacity to do something good for my community. Though it, 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 it comes in the form of, I just don't go and start it. I need to ask for permissions, but going about and asking for these permissions, you find yourself in a situation where these political leaders will try to put that idea of yours down because they feel like there will be an opportunity for them where they can do that particular thing you want to do in order to get the people to vote for them. And I think that's one of the reasons why these things are going down. Um, a, a, a classical example is, um, I'm trying not to be political here, but a classical example is during last year, before elections, it started raining where most places in Accra were flooding. And you had one aspiring politician, John Dumelo, who wanted to help solve a situation in his community, his constituency. And he was basically shut down by the government because they felt he was using that um, problem to amass more people to his side. And when you look at this, when you stop that person from doing, the next time this thing pops up, um, he, he will not be willing to do it. And even um, recently, people are going to school where they are not finding beds, and you have the, these school officials sitting there doing nothing year in, year out. People go there and they don't find beds. And meanwhile, there are lands that investors are willing to build hostels for these students to have a place to um, live and study. But they won't because they feel like when you do that, um, you are taking the assignment from them. So there's a little bit I can say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So it does get a bit tricky when you think about kind of some, some of the like, um, I mean, every place I think has some level of bureaucracy, you know, and sometimes it can get a bit challenging. Um, I think um, personally, when when um, when I was younger and volunteering, like volunteering as a young person, one thing that helped was to connect to like an NGO. And that made it easier to kind of help support what they were doing, maybe introduce some new ideas and be able to push things forward. Um, I think sometimes when a person is on their own, they're trying to push something. It can be a bit, a bit challenging. But when connecting to an NGO, you know, a reputable organization, sometimes it becomes a, a bit, uh, I'll say a bit more strategic to be able to volunteer and to make an impact. So it's just something to think about, um, like how, how one approaches it and, and think about also what are some of the challenges? What are some of the opportunities and then how how can I work through these challenges? So thinking about volunteerism, working with the NGO, or maybe a school or a private school, you know, something like that, um, might might be a way to kind of propel things forward a bit more. Um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit and go back to Andrew because. I didn't ask that you be our timekeeper, but I think you have to be our timekeeper. Can you let us know how much uh, we have going forward? First of all, I thank all of you for contributing. Um, I see a lot of comments, which is great. And I'd love to hear a few more um, of the comments that you all have um, made, uh, but I also want to keep us on task. OK, so, so I, I think, um, thank you, Maya. Our time, we're a bit over our time, so we'll take that final two um, submissions from our participants. I saw Amotunto had his hand up or her hand up. And you can ask your you can ask your question. And then Isaac also had his hand up so he can right after that they can make those submissions and we can wrap up. 
So I'm all, you can ask. All right, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm Tuntu. Hi, welcome. I don't know if you... Um, please, can you hear? Yes, please go ahead. Um, go ahead. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Volunteerism for some okay, time now. Yes. Yes. Um. I think it took a bit. Um, a submission was a, a bit. Um. Sorry, I'm was diverting um, the political and the leadership picking them. Um, or... um, yes, we are having challenges hearing you. Can you can you rather type your submissions in the chat box? Uh, uh, and then um, Isaac can access uh, can make his uh, contribution. Uh, thank you, Maya, for that wonderful presentation. I know people are keen in a lot of comments because when it comes to the topic volunteerism, trust me, it's one of the biggest and you know, one of the key subject areas for every youth or every young person. One guy made mention of drawing when it comes to issues um, with volunteerism. He made mention that there is a need for both organizations and volunteers to draw a clear cut line for whether it's a volunteer or whether it's a service. You are actually rendering a service or it's a volunteer. Many a times organizations don't really draw that clear cut line. They just call people on board, don't even care about the welfare of the volunteer, just use them and then that's all. But I want we the you to also see the beautiful aspect of the whole volunteering aspect. Because for me personally, I was able to acquire a lot of skills I never paid for through the act of volunteerism. I never paid for any of those, but it was through the act of volunteerism I was able to sharpen all these skills. So I will admonish and entreat all of us that once you are youth, you know, some of these things might come, but let's see the beautiful side of the whole volunteerism process. And I think we, we, we will be fine. We will be fine. It shouldn't always go the way we expect. Okay. I, I last year, somewhere last year, I was talking to a couple of youth and I realized that when it comes to volunteerism in Ghana, there are so many challenges that comes with it. So I came up with an organization called the Youth Year Foundation, which is to champion the course of leadership and entrepreneurship through our all year program. And I think we are doing great trying to conscientize and create awareness on the need for every youth to volunteer. So thank you very much. I wish we could continue the conversations about that time on the same topic. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. That was very, very in insightful. Um, we appreciate that. And I think you, you make a really, really good point. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, when a person is volunteering, they're gaining all types of experience that um, they may not realize they would have gained. And, and also, I don't know, um, for those who are interested in, in furthering their education, um, it really looks good. I mean, not to say this should be the motivation for volunteering, but just, you know, something to keep in mind, but it really does look good on your portfolio to show that you have volunteered your time, you've given back to, a, you know, a, a worthy cause or some type of um, social betterment. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Of course, you know, I feel like when you're volunteering, it should be from your heart, not like, oh, what should I get? But, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, volunteering, especially when you're applying for schools, they don't, they don't want to only see, admissions committees don't only want to see, oh, you've, you've, um, you've learned hard and you've gotten perfect uh, grades all throughout. They want to also see, okay, you help to 
make latrines available at a primary school or something, right? Good. So was Amo able to type his question? Hello, uh, am I permitted to ask one question? Sir, moderator, go oh, ahead. We'll take, we'll take one last question. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I want to first of all thank uh, Paya, uh, Maya, sorry. Maya, for, okay. For, for such a great uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, with respect to the videos that uh, we watched, I realized that uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Martin really did a great job by fighting segregation and trying to bring uh, freedom in America. Mm -hmm. uh, in trying to do that, he finally died in the process. Uh, so I want to ask today what do you think or what can you say about segregation and total freedom in america today what is your opinion about that thank you my name is thank Akira. you yeah. thank you so much um well i i will say that um if we look at the period from dr king's time to today um, America has made great strides, um, but like any any nation, and I think um, at the time in President Kennedy's um, speech, he even mentioned that you know America is a work in progress, and I would say that that is the case even today. That you know we're we're always learning. Sometimes you know um, people make mistakes. Number. Sometimes people make mistakes, but the key is that that we know that we're always striving toward excellence. We're we're striving toward um toward doing things better, toward learning, and also toward um not making the same mistakes that were made in the past. So so that's one of the things that we always want to keep keep in mind. Um, that we continue to make positive strides in the right direction. And I think that's it for now. Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you all for also staying with us to the end of our program. Before ending the program, I would like to introduce you to an online resource that you may find helpful. That's the eLibrary USA. E-Library USA is a state-of-the-art digital library with nine premier electronic Ooh. databases that include digital newspapers, magazines, journals, videos, and dissertations. It's now accessible upon request. This, rec uh, this resource is usually available for use only in our American spaces. But with the global pandemic closing our spaces, we are opening up access to this amazing resource to the public. If you are interested, kindly use the link in the chat box to sign up to request access. Please note this is not um, the link to eLibrary USA itself, but rather a request form with which you are granted access. Please use the link to request your access, and uh, you have access to a lot of amazing resources that will help you in your career, professional development, in your school work. And if you are even a writer, you get a lot of resources to help you in your work as well. And then um, on that note, um, thank you for staying with us. Please be reminded by the fact that COVID is still around. So let's adhere to all safety protocols, i.e. washing of hands and uh, running water for at least 20 seconds, practicing social distancing, and also very importantly, wearing a mask in public. Thank you so much for being with us. Till next time, it's bye from us. And stay tuned. Keep following us on our social media channels for more amazing virtual programs as well. We'll see you all next time on the next program. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.